And you've got a listening ear to the Holy Spirit, Mm -hmm. not just to the self-critique or to the cultural messaging of the world. You're inviting the Holy Spirit to speak to you about your body. I think many people live with tremendous shame toward their bodies. And sometimes this has to do with abuse that we've suffered, particularly if we've experienced sexual abuse. For others, maybe it's a belief that somehow our past histories maybe have made us less than. There's a plethora of reasons we could have a long list probably today of why some of us have lived with an unhealthy, unredeemed, graceless view of ourselves. And so just knowing that the Holy Spirit will always speak messages that are different than that. He's always going to be speaking to us about our body being a gift from Him and that we are who we are by God's design. Welcome to Down to Earth. I'm Jessica DeSabatino. And I'm Joyce Reese. And this is a show where we want to be real about God, the scriptures, and how we live our Christian faith out in real time, honoring God and shaping our culture and community around us. We dialogue about the purpose of vocational artists, social justice, generational transformation, why we bother with church, and a whole lot more. We're Joyce and Jess, and we're friends, pastors, and speakers. We thought perhaps we could work on this project together and have a little fun. Our goal is to talk about things we have passion for, connect with others about what matters to them, and together impact our world and honor God. So today we have, like, I think, a really fun topic to discuss. And it's a topic people don't talk about very much. In fact, when you pair these two words together, people kind of give you a quizzical look. Yeah. They don't have any clue. What are you talking about? So we're going to talk about theology of the body. Body theology. Exactly. You know, the first time I ever heard about body theology was from my housemate, Rachel. Did I ever tell you this story? So Rachel was studying, doing her master's at um, Regent College in Vancouver. So theological studies. But she was a dancer And so she was doing her thesis around body theology, and I had never heard of it before. And that started piquing my curiosity, and I started rabbit trailing on some reading that Rachel had. Shout out to you, Rach, in Auckland, New Zealand. Anyway, it provoked me, because I think for years and years, we've had this kind of view in the church that's dualistic. Right. So the body's like the shell or the trap. Right. And, you know, then our spirit's in it. So... The body is set seen as something separate from our spiritual lives. Right. And I think when we read uh, verses like, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind. Soul, s- mind, and strength. Yeah. yeah we, <laughs> we, we actually divorce the body sure. from this idea. Yeah. And that compartmentalization actually goes back to the enlightenment, right? It's right. post-enlightenment reality that we started to disintegrate how we saw things, right? So I go to the gym for my body, or I go to the doctor, or I go to, you know, something. Yeah. And I think when we often hear about, I mean, some pastors do talk about your body and, but I think we only hear it in the context of go to the gym, honor your, honor God. Right. Or don't be gluttonous. Yeah. By exercising, honor God by taking vitamins. Like it's a little bit like a Hulk Hogan kind of eat your vitamins and pray three times a day. (laughs) It's a little bit weird. But I'm I'm really interested in this idea that the that we're integrated beings, body, mind, and spirit, and that the body is not just something physical; that the body is spiritual. So I think body theology is intrinsic to healthy self love and knowledge. This idea of integration is really important because what we believe about our own bodies, and I would even go so far as to say how we judge others and their bodies, directly informs how we participate or interact with God in the world around us. So another way to say it is our ability to believe in God and his love for us as particular people is deeply impacted by our society and false messaging we might receive on a daily or I could even say minutely basis. If we think as many of us do that our bodies, our human bodies have nothing to do with God, then we of course do not have what we would call a Christian worldview. Because just you and I are embodied. I just want us to explore today this idea that We shouldn't think of ourselves in categories, but this body, mind, spirit integration. And when we have that view of what it means to be fully human, I think the spirituality of our lives then has implications 
in all areas, our physical life and vice versa. Right. And I think this sits on the bedrock of Genesis 1 saying that he created man and said that it was good. He didn't create us as bodiless beings, although I'm sure God could have. Right. We could have just been spirits, but instead, in his likeness, he created us. And that is not to say that God has a body like us, but it is to say that he was particular in creating bodies for us, yeah. that that was goodness created and we have to see our bodies. That has to be the foundational aspect of our humanity. Right. That we were created in bodies. Yeah. So when we get this sort of, we'll come to this maybe in a little bit, but the idea of escapist theology, right? Like one day we're out of here and like we forget that we're actually going to be embodied then as well. Right. The resurrected body, like we never are not bodied people. That's the beginning of our story, and it's the end of our story. I think, obviously, this has a different kind of implication for women, but I hope that guys that are listening don't tune out about body theology. Um, but, you know, on the female front, like, we get bombarded with messaging all the time about what's beautiful and the self-critique. I mean, I, I even fall into this at times, and I try really hard not to buy into the cultural messaging about the goodness or the lack of goodness of my physical body if there's things that maybe I perceive as flawed or less than. Have you ever seen that Dove video that was circulating? You know, Dove Soap? Mm -hmm. They had a forensic artist sketch women. You've seen this video? Uh We're going to put it in the show notes. It's so worth watching. Everybody go watch this, okay? The Dove video is when they had this forensic artist. They've got a bunch of women, strangers, and they put them in a waiting room. And then one by one, they would go in and they have to describe first the woman that was sitting next to them in the waiting room. And the artist would sketch that woman. And then they also had to describe themselves to the artist. And then in the big reveal, and I'm not wrecking it, like you go and look at this because it's powerful to watch it, not just hear about it. But in the big reveal, they they put the stranger descriptive image of the woman beside the self-described image of the woman. And then the woman's standing there and you can see clearly the stranger has perceived her beauty more accurately than she has described herself. So you know, if it was me describing myself, then I could end up looking quite bitter or in pain in some of these images. And then the one that the stranger described is really, really accurate and really beautiful. You could see the beauty of these women. And it's a very powerful experience for them to sort of encounter themselves through the eyes of a stranger and a blinded artist. So, you know, that got me thinking when I saw that about... Lots of things, the cultural messaging around bodies, right? So I don't know, in grade eight or something science class, when I was in high school a bajillion years ago, we learned about the endomorph, the ectomorph, and the mesomorph. You learned about this? So the idea that there are three body types, the apple, the pear, and the stick. Right. And now they there's something like 86 body types. Now they go, oh, we were wrong. There wasn't three. And they're not even just subcategories. They're like totally other Right, because nobody is the same. Right, but there are there are sort of broad strokes. There are millions and billions of humans, and there's these like 86 broad strokes. But the idea that God made all of his creation and called it good is pretty profound when you put that up against the diversity of bodies he made, which goes against the cultural myth that says only one body type is good. Right. And everybody needs to aim for that type. We can't. We actually weren't created for that. Right. And some of it is having a good body theology is coming to terms with who you are. Yeah. It's very similar, I think, to having gifts. Like we think of spiritual gifts that God gives us. Well, like if I don't have the gift of, I I don't know, any one of the gifts, then I just got to come to terms with that's not my gift. Right. It's not who I am. No. So you're right. It has a lot to do with self-acceptance or Mm self-love. I always love it. Uh, This is a bit of a rabbit trail, but in um, Matthew 22, when he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, he goes on to say, love your neighbor as yourself. The implication is that you love yourself. Right. But many people struggle with self-loathing, and a lot of the time it's tied to the body. So we got to get healthier on this. We got to start. Right. This is not just an Oprah-ish kind of thing, like love yourself. This is not humanistic. So there is a humanistic kind of love that I think has gone crazy and we've created gods out of our own selves and that's nonsense. What I do think is healthy though, is that we say, okay, I look at my body in the mirror. This is who I am. 
I mean, short of like probably taking an extra trip to the buffet or whatever, uh, if you are who you are, yeah, in basic in basic and measures. And to accept that, I think, you know, obviously we're all broken in some ways. Sure. Poor health is a body example of the brokenness or the curse that we're all living with. But we experience that curse in a lot of other ways too, right? Mm-hmm. I'm recognizing Jesus has come to bring freedom. We live in that tension of the already and the not yet. So there are things that are broken in my body, right? Like I have a huge scar on my neck. I love to tell people that someone took a knife to me in the downtown east side. I like it to be drama, but no, I just had some weird birth defect growing in my neck, now my throat, forever in a day, and it could have killed me, so they had to take it out. So I got this scar. So I think sometimes when I look in the mirror, I wish I didn't have it. Now, lots of people tell me they don't ever notice it, which is just weird to me, but they've got done a better job of accepting what I look like than me. My scars don't stand out to them the way they stand out to me. Or the fact that I have to take meds every day of my life, right? Because I'm hypothyroid, which we got all kinds of brokenness, right? I, I try to say to my friends who struggle with their mental health and have to take meds for their mental health, look, so I take meds for my thyroid. I can't function without them. You take meds for your brain. You can't function without them. So it's just two sides of the same coin. Exactly. We all have brokenness. Yep. And we have body brokenness we kind of have to accept. That doesn't mean don't aim for well-being. Right. That doesn't. Yeah, exactly. We do actually, we are temples of the Holy Ghost. The Bible's clear about that. So we we do have to take care of our bodies as much as possible. Stewardship. However, yes. But however, there is, there are some things about us that are unchangeable. And I mean, this is something I think we try to teach preschoolers. There are some, if you have brown hair, that's what you, I mean, I guess now, thanks to Clarell, you can change that if you want. But (laughs) I'm rocking the gray, baby. There are some things you can't, change and you just got to say okay I'm okay with that right. some of us spend our whole lives trying to change things that are not changeable right and we never get comfortable with our own so this is self. a good example actually um you color your hair I don't color my hair right right we have big beef about it no it's totally cool like it's an expression of who we are right and it's our our way of being us right so for me like i remember a bunch of years ago having a chat with one of my nephews who just was very concerned that i was like let myself go cuz i'd stop coloring my hair and and i just i said okay so for me i'd done all this reading about cancer and carcinogens and my mom died and i already have super high risk categories cuz she died at 50 so genetically, I'm predisposed to certain things. And they'd proven that brunette hair dye. See, you're off the hook, Jess, because you take the color out. Yes. I was putting the color in. I might be putting it back in. You never know. I no, okay, right. Show, so, show it, it But hair. your risks aren't the same as mine. Right. So I just had to decide, okay, what matters to me and my body? This isn't a judgment on people that color their hair. This is more like, what do I think is good for me and stewarding my life? So I just stopped coloring my hair. Now everybody thinks I'm like tree hugging hippie. I know. She is. Don't <laughs> don't let her telling you deceive you. She is on but, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday making her own soap. And she I did has make a, a very large batch of granola this morning. Yes. She's a hippie. Okay, but the Bonafide. point <laughs> The point is, I, I totally dispute that. But my point is just this I, I have freedom to be me. So for me to not be your hippie self. Great. Rock the gray. And you know what? For someone else who's like said no that's okay come to your own conclusions about yourself the only caveat i would say is if we're not accepting ourselves and we're striving after something else because we're rejecting the self then we want to have jesus break in on that right and set us free so i don't know maybe that is a little bit of freedom in my life that i don't really care if you love my gray hair or don't love my gray hair i like my gray hairs i'm keeping it you know but it's not a soapbox it's not a an announcement to the world. It's just, I like who Jesus made me and I'm not afraid of aging. I guess that's another part of it. And I don't want to, I don't want to participate with things that are going to hurt my body more, especially, you know, when I have already some different kind of risks. Anyway, that's a bit of a rabbit trail, but I think there is brokenness in our bodies and there's grace, right? And Jesus can reveal his glory through us. That's why I think anybody who knows people who are disabled, or if you've read any Henry Nouwen or Jean Vanier and learned from them their spiritual development, their journey with Jesus, you'll realize like, hey, we can learn and have revelation of God, even through people whose bodies are tremendously broken with disability. 
Uh, The gift of their personhood is a revelation of grace and beauty and goodness from God, regardless of bodies that are broken. Right. And I think if we don't learn to accept ourselves and our own bodies, what are we saying about others' bodies who could be far more broken than ours? Exactly. Right. If I'm, if I can't accept myself because of the shape of my nose or the, the giant unibrow I have. Yes. Amen to that. I have that too. (laughs) But if we can't accept our own brokenness, then what we are saying about the worth of other people yep. is screaming loudly to the world. All right. And I am a believer that we cannot say on one hand, pro-life, 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 but then not be pro-life about ourselves and about the life that God has given us. Yeah. And we have to be consistent in philosophy. Well, and I think that's where... The rub is a lot of times we're just not even thinking about this stuff. Absolutely. We just are disciples of the culture. The culture says Botox yourself up the wazoo or I don't know, like get some machines so your armpits don't sweat anymore. Like this just weird There's stuff. There's a machine that makes your armpits not I'm sweat I'm deadly anymore? serious about what this. this. You could go to a plastic surgeon and they do weird things to your underarms. Like you're supposed to sweat people for a reason. It's so that you can be healthy. I would like someone to email us about oh, this. That's so procedure. weird. I don't even know how I know that. Trust me. But. I am less of a hippie than Joyce. <laughs> I, I am more forward in technology. Uh, and if point, you're a plastic surgeon and you're listening to this and you're mortified at what we're saying, okay, look, there's a case, a place no, and a time. No, I'm for you. Please send me your information. But there is something about the culture in the buy-in to altering us ourselves perpetually because we don't like what we see right and we no don't plastic accept. surgery is going to fix that no you don't accept yourself that's why like how much they on and on you. and on and on until people don't look like humans anymore right and there are some times when plastic surgery is acceptable and it is okay because what you are is okay with yourself yeah and you're just fixing something up all right that's fine what we're saying is this is not prescriptive right what i think we're trying to get at is when you have a Good body theology, when you have good body theology yeah. and it's healthy body theology, what you become is okay with who God has made you to be. Right. And you've got a listening ear to the Holy Spirit, mm-hmm. not just to the self critique or to the cultural messaging of the world. You're inviting the Holy Spirit to speak to you about your body. I think many people live with tremendous shame toward their bodies. And sometimes this has to do with abuse that we've suffered, particularly if we've experienced sexual abuse. For others, maybe it's a belief that somehow our past histories maybe have made us less than. There's a plethora of reasons. We could have a long list probably today of why some of us have lived with an unhealthy, unredeemed, graceless view of ourselves. And so just knowing that the Holy Spirit will always speak messages that are different than that. He's always going to be speaking to us about our body being a gift from him and that we are who we are by God's design, Um, not, you know, the composite of all the traumas we might have survived. I think it's also important, you touched on this a little bit, Jess, that we have a body theology that includes a creation view. God made us, right? As human beings, and there's this goodness. But you want to go a little bit further than that, and you want to take not just a creation view, but then what we would call a Christological view of the body. Right. So we bear God's image. Like that's something we only understand in part, but it's a really radical thing to realize he bears our image as well. Right. So the body makes visible, scripture says, what is invisible. This is especially true, of course, when we think of the incarnation of Christ. And God who could not be seen entered into our world coming as a man. Important to realize, not in a man. And we are able to see and hear and touch and experience our salvation. John says it this way in John 1 14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. I don't know if we always think of the implications of that. I think we just think of that as a nice Christmas story. Oh yeah. Jesus became a baby. Right. But I, or almost I, like poetry. The word, the word, word became, became flesh. flesh. It's a Christmas, right? It's a Christmas song. So I like I think though if we can actually let that sink into our psyche for a minute. Yeah. So all the complaining and all the obsession our culture has about body and body image and body yeah. type and and then you think no Jesus came and put on a body. 
right. to redeem that. Yeah. That is insane. If you'll take it from just your from just your head and actually yep. let it infiltrate your heart. Yeah. So you God, might be God actually never intended that you'd be caught up hating your body. Yeah. He actually said, No, your body is good and it's so good that I'm going to I'm actually going to show you I'm going to show up in a body like yeah. like yours. Yeah. So this is a way to hear it. You know, right now I can just I see people maybe they're listening to this podcast on the train or on a bus or driving a car or maybe you're laying on a couch or I don't know where you're listening doing the dishes. But all of us are being engaged somehow physically right now. We're breathing. We're sitting maybe we're in motion in some way. Think about this. The flesh is the hinge of salvation. Or another way to say it is there is no salvation without a body. So God chose to take on human form. And of course, that is important in terms of the birth of Christ. But it's also true about the temptations, which were all physical, right? And then also his death and then finally his resurrection. All of these points of our salvation are tied to his physical body. Jesus, and this is the part that I love, Jesus did not unbecome human after his resurrection. He still ate food and walked and talked. He could be seen and touched. And here's the best part. His body bore scars. I love this stuff. Like our God not only took on flesh and embodiment to reveal salvation to us, he continues to be embodied in a glorified body and has now taken our humanity to heaven. This Two directional grace and bodily form is incredibly profound. He's representing us as one of us. So we're forever united with God as humanity simply by virtue of the embodiment of Jesus that's ongoing. Right. Like when I realized, like, I think of Jesus in the resurrected, perfected state, right? Right. And it's so weird that he was resurrected and still bore scars. Right. Because you got to think, God raised him from the dead. He could have used a little like that cream, that scar away cream. Why the scars? Right. Why? And I all all the time think the scars, at least from what we can see in the gospel accounts, were the proof pudding that he was who he was. Right. It's Thomas identifies him by his scars. And I think pay attention to this. There's something that's known by the scarring of our suffering Mm -hmm. that is the revelation of Jesus. Right. That I mean, you could just ponder that for the next 10 years and the Lord could just keep revealing stuff to us. We're so obsessed in our culture with the world's view of perfection. Right. And we don't begin to see that the imperfections in our body actually point to our need a for a savior, but also our, that, that we are human. Yeah. So I actually had a woman in our church. We were pastoring at a while ago who um, came to see me for some pastoral care. And actually what she was wrestling with was whether to have significant plastic surgery because she'd had a situation where she had need for physical healing on her body that only a plastic surgeon could provide. But she didn't know if that was like buying into the wrong cultural view or would God be okay with that? She was genuinely trying to pursue a healthy framework for whether she would pursue this surgery. And it was like an eight week recovery period. And it was very, very serious surgery. And I remember being really impressed that she even was considering her life in Jesus ahead of having this procedure done. But where we landed in the conversation, I never told her what to do or not to do. I just tried as a pastor to help her discern and to listen to the Lord. But it was the conversation about the scars that Jesus bore on his body that helped her make her decision because she, the surgery would produce scars. And what I said to her is, yes, but you have a different type of brokenness right now. So it's it's that kind of identification of the healing or the brokenness that you live with right now. So one way or another, it's identifiable physiologically. And that was it for her. She was able to have the surgery and realized, okay, I'm going to see this as a grace in my life and that Jesus is with me in the scarring. Mm -hmm. It was quite profound for her. Mm -hmm. And I think for me too, because then not long after that, I had to have the throat surgery or whatever. And I kind of joke about my, you know, big slash on the neck, but there was a point where I realized I had to be okay with the truth about who I am and that there's comfort because Jesus has walked these sort of discomforted paths or, or more to the point the crucifixion was incredibly brutal 
And so there's nothing that we experience physiologically that would leave a pain history on our body that he hasn't identified with. Mm -hmm. I think it's quite, quite profound. But of course, the mystery continues, right? It's not just this idea of scars on the resurrected body. Like, I, I try to say to people like this, like, your body matters. Christ's body matters. Like, matter. Like, actual, the word matter. And because of that, our union with Christ and his indwelling in our body actually matters. So you said it, we're the temple of the Holy Spirit. Do you want to talk a bit about what that means, Jess? Yeah, so, I mean, if God lives inside of us, if we, we actually, you know, all throughout Scripture, there are these metaphors that God literally dwells inside of us. It's crazy. And I, I think we've actually made this too much of a metaphor. Yeah. I actually think we've spiritualized much of this talk when the Scripture is quite clear that He actually dwells in our bodies. It says yeah. He will quicken your mortal bodies yeah. if the Spirit dwells in you. It's in a number of places. I remember Connor asking me when he was about three, just exactly how does God fit into my heart, mom? Mm -hmm. And I was like, ah, oh, it's a mystery, buddy boy. And try to explain, like, because we, we use the word possession quite negatively, like if someone's possessed by an evil spirit or right. get freaked out by those texts. But the count, the, you know, the contrast is that we're possessed by the Holy Spirit. Right. Right. It's to be literally filled up and controlled by Right. The presence that of God. That he would take the driver's seat. Right. We would all often say that, and maybe you've heard that in a Sunday school class when you were small, that you give Jesus the driver's seat, that mm -hmm. you get out of the driver's seat. Should be some kid's song about that somewhere. Yeah. But I, th but I think it's still a really apt mm -hmm. um, metaphor for us that Jesus should actually control not just our spirit, but also our body. Yeah. And this matters in issues of holiness, in issues of stewardship, that Jesus, that the Holy Spirit controls us, yeah, controls spiritual our gifts actual even. body, yeah. what we say, how we behave, how our bodies react. And I think this doesn't allow us then to say things like the devil made me do it, or I just couldn't control myself, or I, you know, my hormones got the best, or whatever your favorite excuse is. Yeah. Because we and, all have one. Right. And so there's this tension, and anybody listening knows this tension between the part where we have to welcome the presence of the Holy Spirit. Yes. We have to listen for the voice of the Holy Spirit. We have to engage in the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And allow, actually allow him to have control. Yeah. Like that giving of for control. For direction. Yeah, but that, we have to respond to it. Right. That giving of control, though, is often on a minute-by-minute -minute basis. Totally. We continue to give control. So it's not a one-stop shop. Right. This goes all the way back to the pilot episode about the Lordship of Christ, right? right? So when you welcome, not just it's not just surrender for forgiveness of sins and the life to come. This is about the Lordship of Christ, the voice of God in us, the welcome of his living presence mm -hmm. in and through us on a daily basis. And that requires an engagement. I don't think I've told this story. If I did, and it's a repeat from another episode, call it a bonus that you could hear it twice, but. Me and a couple of friends, this is before I was married, the same year actually I turned 30. So we were living in an apartment in an old mansion in Shaughnessy in Vancouver. So it's like a posh neighborhood, like Kurt Russell and Goldie Hawn were our neighbors. We never saw them, but they had their Vancouver house. Lots of you don't even know who that is. Think Kate Hudson's parents. <laughs> okay. But anyways, we were living in that house and it was subdivided. And so our apartment's, you know, one part of, I don't know, maybe eight or nine apartments and we all had shared use of the laundry room and one day I went in there realizing I'd forgotten my laundry in the dryer from the day before which is kind of rude for your other people in the house so I quickly went in to get my stuff out and this woman who was living on the third floor said oh hey I was just getting my load going and so we had a little chit chat and never met her before and she just out of the blue she just looked at me and she said can I ask a question I was like sure she said, do you have the corner bedroom in the back of the house by the garden? And I said, yeah, I do. Why? And like I knew she lived on the third floor and I was on the ground floor. So it wasn't even like noise traveling up. Like I couldn't imagine what she wanted to know. And she said, I know this is kind of crazy sounding, but I'm just, I'm interested in what spirit you're channeling. Hmm. And I was like, what? <laughs> Now, I'm from Vancouver, and there's some interesting people there, and yeah, it's a bit of a new age hippie culture. That's why Jess thinks I'm a hippie, but I know real hippies, and that's why I know I'm not. But 
here this woman was asking me what spirit I was channeling. I was like, what are you talking about? And she said the most powerful aura comes up like light and color through the floor in her room. I think she described it as like quite purple and and big. Like she said, it comes every morning and every night I see this spiritual aura. And I've been wondering what spirit it is because I've never encountered a spirit like that before. It's the most beautiful and powerful or I've ever seen and she wanted to channel it and so I just said well it's the most powerful spirit anybody could ever encounter and then of course began to explain to her that it was the Holy Spirit but like I have uh, I even then I had a pretty developed body theology but it never occurred to me that when I had a spiritual discipline of prayer when I woke up in the morning and when I went to sleep at night somebody living two floors above me could be encountering the holy spirit because I had this engaged practice of prayer mm-hmm. physiological encounter in her body because of what was going on in my life in my embodied existence two floors down and that got me always thinking that our bodies are capable of revealing the beauty and grace of Jesus because he dwells in us. So she could experience it in the laundry room. She said, I can even see like this kind of color around you, you know. And so I just encouraged her to invite the Holy Spirit. I was like, well, when you have your spiritual practices, why don't you just invite the Holy Spirit? Of course, I talked to her about how some spirits masquerade as angels of light and their darkness and explained a few things. And I just really believed that if she would invite the Holy Spirit, she would encounter him. And she wasn't going to encounter him in her head. Right. She was going to encounter him physiologically because that's the way she'd been encountering him up to this point that had provoked this question. Yeah. And I think this is the exact reason why there has been a movement, no matter what denomination, if you look at denominations across the board, Christian denominations, you'll see that there's been a movement to more physical worship. Right. That's not because people like wanted to be more charismatic. I actually think that's a turning, a really good turning to yeah. understanding that our worship, we had to be engaged with our body. Yeah, That's why David throughout the Psalms says, I will lift up my hands and yeah. I will prostrate myself on the floor because there is something good about engaging our bodies yes. as we worship God. And our Jewish brothers and sisters understand this. Whenever yeah. they are Orthodox Jews will pray, they will move back and forth, back and forth in a very poignant way of moving their bodies. Yeah. So like when we get into church and you think, why are they clapping? And we talked about this a little bit on the podcast of... Yeah, when we were talking about worship. Worship, but I, I do think it bears for us to underscore the fact that this is why we have to engage our bodies when we engage with God. Totally. I mean, have you ever met somebody and you knew they were a Christian because you could just tell physiologically? Like they shine? Yeah, sure. I mean, partly I think it's the language we use, which is part of our embodiment as well. Right. That language is, you you can't have language and be a ghost. Right. Or spirit. Yeah. So language is part of our... Physiologically. Yeah. It's interesting. I, my son, I finally clued in that a couple of the staff at the school were Christians after the end of the school year, a couple of years ago, one of them said, Hey, we'll be praying all summer for your family. And, and I was a little bit shocked. And then I came home and I said to my husband, did you know that so-and-so and such and such are Christians? And Finley overheard me. He was like, mom, I could have told you that. And I was like, how did, how did you know? And he said, because you can see Jesus in them. And to him as a five-year-old or six-year-old at the time, it was like super obvious and he had been able to identify this. But as we grow older, I think sometimes we minimize those things or I don't know, we don't have the same eyes to see physiologically what's going on, but our bodies are able to reveal the presence of God. I mean, that's why Moses, when he came down off the mountain, right, his physical being glowed. He had to cover his face up with a veil because it was shining so much and I don't know. It's been one of my aims in life to become one of those women that just radiate the presence of Jesus. A few years ago, I was convinced, probably 20 years ago, that with women who are really full of the Holy Spirit, you often can't tell their age by looking at their face. You have to look at their hands. Their hands will tell you like the work and the wrinkles and stuff, but their face, the I don't know if I'm right about this, okay? It's just a theory I have, but their faces just radiate the joy, the presence of Jesus. It's physiological what you can see on them and in them. That's my that's yeah, my anti-aging I, cream right there. <laughs> I also think that we can't negate the power of our words as we talk about this, because I yeah. do think words are physiological. Right, that's important. I think this is why language matters. 
I think this is why it's not good enough that we're willy nilly with our language and say, well, it doesn't really matter because like, right. language is man made. And, you know, there's all kinds of people, I think, using language inappropriately right now. And call me old fashioned. Right. The idea from the Old Testament that there's life and death and the power of the tongue. Right. So I, I think actually how we use our words and how we communicate with one another is a sign. And this is obvious, but I think it, it is a sign of the inbreaking kingdom in our life, but also how we think about our bodies yeah, and how we actually manifest the presence of God. Be interesting to tie that. Maybe this will be another episode, but to tie that idea to God spoke all of the physical world into existence. Mm -hmm. And when we speak, it still impacts the physical world. Absolutely. Yeah, I would agree with you, Jess. I think that's a, that'd be a really interesting topic to explore a little bit more deeply. You know, 1 Corinthians 12 says this, and it's interesting because we extrapolate parts of this away from, or we let it sit more, I guess, as a way to say we let it sit as if it's just metaphor. Right. But try and hear this text, not metaphorically, okay? Just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. It's so easy for us to believe that some of us are better than others or that some are more beautiful or more valuable or extra special in some way, right? But that's not how Christ taught us to think. That's the way of the world. That idea, I remember Lauren Hill, we got to see her this summer. Oh man, that was so awesome. But the idea that we would compare ourselves amongst ourselves. Remember, she talks about that, right? And this striving, competition, jealousy, envy, discord, disunity. And I actually think we read that text and we go, yeah, we're one body, many parts. But we still have an individualized idea of our part of the body instead of the cohesion of the whole. Right. I don't know if I'm making sense, but when we participate in that type of thinking or judging, I don't think we're reflecting the life of Jesus that Paul's talking about in Corinthians here. We're actually more reflecting the values of the world around us. That we all have to be one kind of person. Yeah. And so how do we, how do we walk that out in real life? I mean, part of the thing that I've been asking myself recently is if 500 people showed up in my community that were totally other than me, and everybody's going to have a different other, so for some people, mm-hmm. other might be 500 billionaires show up in their life. Would I be quick to judge them and just say, no, no, they don't really, they're not really eyes or feet or hands or. Right. If 500 people of a different ethnicity showed up in my community. And this is the question I've been asking myself. How do I, wh- where is my other? And I think we've got to work hard to find our other. Yeah. So this does have to do with often we pretend like, oh, no, I have no, I have no prejudice to people because I'm a Christian. But I think we got to push a little bit harder on ourselves because yeah. I think in each of us there are parts of us that are other, like that we that we're not comfortable with. So here's something I just thought of. But racism just to borrow it as one thing. Yeah. Racism is a brokenness of body theology. Absolutely. It's absurd body theology. Yeah. I never really thought about that until right now, but that's the root core of it. So yeah. whatever the, whoever the other is that we reject or we think is less than the biases and prejudices, of course, in Canada, I think our systemic racism is toward indigenous people in this country. And so we pass quiet judgments in our hearts that they're less than, or they're not as whatever, smart, gifted, yeah. capable, we assume all kinds of things about narratives in other people. It's not just indigenous people. There'll be other others, right, that we would reject for different reasons. You know, I actually know people who will just flat out reject people because they're, they weigh 80 pounds more than them. And I just think that's insane. Mm-hmm. 
Or we are doing a series at church right now talking about the value of children and through, you know, God's lens. And in the ancient Near East, the child was seen as, you know, inferior, mm-hmm. right? And, Not a real human yet. Right. Half human. And I think, well, we have all kinds of mix up around what we think about kids these days. We can talk about that on another podcast. But there are some of us who are other is a, a child. Yeah. I think the tendency for us, especially in this very politically correct environment, is to pretend that we don't have another. The challenge for us is to dig a little bit deeper, though, and and really find out who the other is in our life. Because I am sure that I've got others, mm-hmm. you've got others. It doesn't matter where you are and how yeah. you've grown up. We all have people that we kind of mm, are squeamish about. Now, we're probably okay with them in small doses. Yeah. So but- the question is, if they were to overwhelm your particular influencing group, how would you be feeling about the group of other men? Yeah. And yeah. that's how that's how you realize your other surface to the top. It's really good. I think the flip side of this, okay, so we're talking about how we negatively respond to people that look or are different than us, right? The flip side is the excessive celebration of people that fit the cultural ideology. Idealization. So, you know what, I want to tell this story because I, I think it's really important. And hopefully it doesn't sound arrogant, okay? But I got really tired of being that Uber person when I would go speak at a conference, right? Like all of a sudden people thought, oh, because I have a gift to speak, then I must have extra special something from God. This is this Christian celebrity kind of mentality that I think is so counter to who Jesus calls us to be. Like really flies in the face of the passage we just read about one body, many parts. And so I asked the Lord one day, like, how can I better explain to people that this is a cultural value, this idea of celebrity, and that it doesn't fit with a kingdom lens? The way we follow Jesus, this is antithetical to a Christian worldview. And then I got this picture. And I I still think, like, I couldn't in a hundred years have thought this up. This had to have been from the Holy Spirit. And so what I saw was dozens and dozens and dozens of bowls, like B-O-W-L-S, you know, like a sugar bowl and a cereal bowl and a mixing bowl. And there was glass bowls and wooden bowls and pottery bowls. And they were big and small and every size in between. And like every kind of bowl you could find in a household or in a hundred households. And they were this long line of all these varied materials and functions and and then there was one bowl in the very middle that it kind of zoomed in on and it was this really intricately carved crystal bowl the kind that you would like you know maybe put on a A fancy table yeah or like at christmas you might float candles in it or be pretty flowers or put it as a centerpiece and i heard god speak to my heart like can't even really explain that to this day but he said people think you're this bowl extra special, super valuable for fancy things. And he said, that's not who you are. And so I was like, okay, show me which bowl I am. And I like in my mind, I think I thought it was like some nice wooden carved you thought, bowl. I was going to say because you you're put a hippie in, in your yes. heart. You were thinking it was going to be wood bowl. or pottery. Come on now. <laughs> but then he took me way down to the end and I'm not even joking you. I got to the end and there was a toilet bowl. And he said, this is who I've called you to be. Just keep the body healthy flush the crap. And that hit me like a ton of bricks, right? Like, so my, I have this teaching gift that's supposed to help us get what's nutri- nutrient into our, you know, lives and get rid of the stuff that is not good for us that needs to, like, it's quite a picture, right? right. To be a toilet bowl. And I realized that bowl, that toilet bowl has a ton of function. It gets used all the time. It's super important in the, the house, Right. But it doesn't make it more valuable in the sense of the celebrity ideology, right? So you might be a person that is actually the crystal bowl. You get pulled out on rare and special occasions and God puts fragrant things in you. And it's the feature, okay, for the family meal and the people of God. Follow the the metaphor. But for me, I just thought, man, we've got it all wrong. We're all trying to be the crystal bowl. And most of us have everyday functions in God's family life, if you want to put it that way. We're vessels for his use, right? Right. So don't scorn the kind of vessel he's made you to be and the function you have that is actually tied to body theology because a lot of our judgments get tied around 
you know, what we look like or what someone else looks like or how valuable they are, how successful they are based on their external hipness or size of their waist or whether they have gray hair or not gray hair. Trying to pick some examples. A book deal. No book deal. Right. It's just, it's really important that we get to a place where we can value one another and not, so like I was saying at the beginning, there are two sides to this coin you were describing, Jess, getting the ability to welcome the other. Right. So that'll shape us. And then the flip side to not try to be something uber Mm -hmm. to be ourselves. Well, I think always reminding ourselves, I think I remind our church of this almost every week. The kingdom of God is flat. It is not a hierarchical organization. There are not the fancy folks at the top and then like the minions on the bottom. That is not biblical. Yeah. All throughout the New Testament, we see that this this new covenant that God was setting up was to be one where we all have a part to play yeah. and not one is better than the other. Right. And Paul goes to great lengths. I, I actually am shocked that we don't get this. Because yeah. if you read the New Testament from Matthew to Revelation, you'll see that Paul, in much of his writing, and Peter, go, they go to great lengths to keep saying, like, I'm nothing. I'm nothing. Stop thinking that I'm somebody that I'm not. I'm nothing. I'm just the least of these. And we think of that as just poetic waxing, like he's sort of being falsely humble. I I think he was actually trying to remind us that the kingdom of God is flat. It's flat. It's flat. It's flat. If we'll remember that, if we can get up in the morning and for those of us that feel less than worthy, that's a good reminder. I got to play my role today. I got a role to play. And for those of us that have the tendency to think that we are all that, by the way, that's a very hard thing to look at yourself and say, yeah, I have that tendency. Oh, I I've always heard... tell people I've got like my growth curve for my entire life with Jesus is going to be my pride. Yeah. I don't have the issue of self-loathing. Right. I have the opposite problem. It's two sides of the same coin. Neither one is a healthy view of the self. Right. But I, but I think coming to that, I think there are more people in our culture currently who don't have self-loathing, who grew up in a trophy culture where you got a trophy for participating so i, th- <laughs> so I, think, I think we Uber have about a, everything yeah and i and i think a lot of us have breakdowns when we think oh i'm not being used as much as i should be uh-huh. if i had a dollar for every person that said i'm waiting for the lord to open up an uber ministry for me or some kind of fancy what they're really saying is i'm waiting to be on tv or to ha- have write my a 15 minutes of fame yeah and i just want to keep saying to people just be faithful where you are right just be faithful where you yeah. are can we can we go one one other little direction? Yep. This is going to make people a tiny bit uncomfortable. And, but I, and I, I, wa- I may or may not disagree with you on right, this. Right. I don't know if you're going to agree with me. I do want to just touch on the idea about what we do with our bodies or in our bodies uh, in terms of our life in Jesus. Because our bodies, I think, are sacramental. And we talked a bit about this on the week when we talked about communion they reveal mystery. So 1 Corinthians six nineteen. you kind of referenced this earlier. Do you not know your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who's in you, who you have received from God? So in context, that passage in Cor- to the Corinthian church, you know, is that there, there, the Corinthian argument was there was grace for everything. I can do whatever I want. So, and I think many people in Corinth and probably in Calgary today still have the idea that the body doesn't matter because the emphasize, emphasis in spirituality is spirit, right? But the Apostle Paul speaks to this way of thinking when he continues in 1 Corinthians 6. He says, the body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Like, we're talking real body theology from Paul right here. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead and he will also raise us. So don't you know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute, or what we would say now, sex worker, is one with her in body? For it is said the two will become one flesh, but whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins people commit are outside their bodies. But those who sin sexually sin against their own bodies. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? Here it is, who's in you and who you receive from God. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. So I think it's very safe to say that our sexuality matters to our spirituality. And I'm not talking do's and don'ts, but rather about an embodied understanding of what it means to belong to or be united with Christ. I really strongly believe that sex is spiritual always. 
we could learn a lot more about that, but that would be a total another podcast. So the idea that the physical has spiritual life in it and vice versa is very evident in this scripture. But I want to just diverge a tiny bit and talk about exercise. This is where our opinions will diverge. Right. Physical exercise as prayer. Right? Like, so, or as a spiritual practice. Agreed. There is no yogi on the planet that is devout yogi that wouldn't think that yoga is tied to the Hindu faith. Correct. And that it is an act of worship. That's how, like, that's how yogis see yoga. Now, we separate it out all the time. And this is where different people listening will have very different opinions and it can get very heated. And I'm not trying to upset I'm anybody. Be the fire okay? on the other side. That's of all right. I, so like, I don't mind are, some pushback. They're vehemently disagreeing with Joyce. I am right on now. your side. Yeah. I am here for you. So, but this is where, you know, for me, I go, I hear people say, well, it doesn't matter. I can practice yoga and be a Christian because it has nothing to do with my life in Jesus. It's not spiritual. It's physical. I'm deep breathing. I'm stretching. It's, it helps calm me. But I say, no, we're integrated body, mind, and spirit. But I would push back and yeah. say, no, I think it's like acts. So yes, where they were eating food to idols and ah, uh, we're going to come to that. Yes, but I but I would say that no, all things can be redeemed. This for wasn't Christ. in the book of Acts. You ready for this? This is this text. Uh, yes, in one Corinthians ten. Okay, so listen to this. One Corinthians ten. He's going after idol worship and eating, and we always use that as like the weak strong argument. Well, if you have a bad conscience about it, it bothers you to eat meat that's been sacrificed to idols, then don't. But I don't have a strong conscience about that, so I'm free. I can go ahead and eat it, right? But he explains that there's a real demon. There's no real God behind the idol. There are real demons. And Paul's saying, don't go there. What you do with your body matters. If you're in Christ, he says, do not be a participant with demons. So verse 21, you cannot drink. This is physical language. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You cannot have part in both the table of the Lord and the table of demons. So that's like, he's talking sacramental theology, but he's talking about what you're eating, what you bought at the groceries at the market and what you put on your table. And he tells them not to do it. Right. But there are other parts in scripture. If you look at the whole of scripture, there are other parts that say, no, 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 no. If you, if you are not sacrificing to that idol, it's not going to kill you to eat that food. God doesn't care about food itself. What he cares about is your heart. Right. And so, so yeah, I, we can go back even to one Corinthians. Uh, no, uh, Second Kings five or one Kings five, where um, Naaman gets healed. I think it's Second Kings, right? And he says, "When I go into the temple, Ramon, and I bow down it, I, in my heart, I'm still for you know the God of Israel, but it's my job. I have to go in with the king. So right, so right. Well, I wouldn't even make that m- so much of a stretch, but I do think that there there is precedent for saying if my heart is towards God and the things of God." then that which the enemy meant for harm okay. can be turned around for You good. could be right, Jess. You could be right. Here's my biggest I caution. I also can't do yoga. so <laughs> Right. But here's... He, my body is like Gumby. True. You would come apart at the seams. Yes. Okay. Here's what I want to say, though. I think there are a lot of people that call themselves followers of Jesus who are mindlessly doing yoga. Yeah. Not realizing that every single pose is dedicated to a Hindu god. Now, I hear hear the arguments, right? Because people talk to me about this because I'm vocal about it. Have I ever gone to a yoga class? Yes. I haven't just decided something about something and not actually like gone to see what it's about, right? So I did a a yoga course. Have you gone to a Christian yoga class? No, I have not. I had a real yogi. Maybe you should. Okay, but here's the thing for me. Like the argument is which came first, the chicken or the egg, right? So which came first? Well, God gave us the bodies. So... Did someone stretch like this or pose like this before it became the sun salutation or before it became the downward facing, whatever? Well, I'm sure they did because babies do this. Right. Do and so that's movements. the argument is then it doesn't matter as long as I'm doing it to the Lord or enjoying the body God gave me and I'm not obviously yeah, engaged like You're just with making demons. my argument right now. Right. But I guess for me, today. I just go, I would way rather have nothing to do with demons nothing to do with idols, nothing to do with anything that's rooted in Hinduism or Buddhism or any other ism, 
because I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. Right. But I mean, if that were the case, then I think then you should stop celebrating Christmas because it's rooted in a pagan holiday. Ah, uh, see, now we're going to go the Celtic way of evangelism. <laughs> I like that. I have Easter, you Easter now. is a better example, right. actually. Well, like I'm saying, there's a hundred different things that I would say. But like, like, Reese, you should probably just corner yourself up in this room. No, but like, listen to me forever. about this. So let's borrow Easter. So it was the pagan fertility cult celebration festival, and they thought that the ultimate announcement of life was procreating, sex. That's where we get Easter bunnies and little baby chicks and eggs. This is all symbols of Easter, right? That's because they're prolific symbols of abundant life. And so back in the day when we co-opted it as a Christian holiday, it was to make an ultimate announcement of life, which was the resurrection. It wasn't Christians can have sex too. Right. And we can can have really like great, awesome orgies. Like, no, no. No. So we, that's not, do you see what I'm saying? That's where the argument falls down. Like, oh, well, we can do yoga and then not be about these idols. Well, when Christians co-opted things like Christmas or Easter, they didn't make it the same cultural celebration and just say it's unto the Lord. So, but I'm saying, I, could could you not do that? Why, why couldn't you do that with yoga? Because Why not? Ah, I don't know exactly. Okay. This is really good pushback. <laughs> I like this. But to me, I just, I think people end up with a participation with demonic stuff that they aren't aware of. Could you pray protection? Yes. Okay. Could you pray surrender? Yes. But I just think, why so do we I'm, have to? What I'm going to say to you is what I think is happening here is you don't actually care enough about doing yoga to actually do Maybe. the work to make it to make it redeemed by Christ. You don't care. You sure. don't care about doing planks. Here's, and, here's so another if part. If it was something you cared about, Maybe. though, Joyce, then what you can do, I think everything is redeemable. But it does take thought. I think it goes back to what you're thinking. I agree with you 100%. We've got all, all kinds of Christians doing things without thought. Right. And I think. And it takes too much thought. So okay. you're just saying, I got a busy life. I don't want to deal with you it. You could and be I, right, Jess. You really could be right about this. But here's this is where I'm so concerned as a pastor. Yoga understands body theology better than the Christian church. Yeah, and we're getting into syncretism. Absolutely. For not It careful. is an engaged theological practice if you're devout yoga practicer and you're Hindu. It's an engaged body practice that is spiritual in its essence. Agreed. So that's where I have concerns because I think there are thousands, actually maybe millions of Christians that have just mindlessly participated in the worship of other stuff without any idea. And I would rather that we became integrated spiritually with our own bodies so then Joyce somebody can argue Christian up, yoga. Julie, blah, blah, Joyce blah, is going to be putting out a DVD with <laughs> weird moves in it. All to Jesus. All right. This is a good debate. It really is a good debate. And I actually genuinely hope that our listeners wrestle with it. Don't just say, see, Jess says it's okay. Or Joyce says it's not okay. Send Don't, us mail about this. Do. I actually would genuinely love to hear in an email or uh, a tweet or something. Go on our Facebook page and tell us what you think. I'd love to hear some thoughts about this and some different examples, maybe from your own life. But I do want us to be thinking. I don't want you just to say this person's on my side, even though I haven't really thought it through. Right. I think that's the... And be listening to the Holy Spirit. That's the bane of everyone's existence right now, that we just get pick a side. Yeah. And we don't actually think through the implications of that side. And we don't actually have real dialogue. And we actually... Or real prayer. Well, and we continue to to make enemies of people like right. if you and i don't agree then we certainly can't be friends oh no anymore. then the podcast is over now <laughs> <laughs> and more to po- the point our friendship hey can we tell what can i tell one more story about body theology yes i am the. this is a good one this is what this is a pastoral dilemma any clergy listening might have a heart attack while i tell this one but so i pastored in the downtown east side of vancouver for a bunch of years and during those years there, we had a guy who was palliative uh, with cancer, and he'd been an addict, and he came to Jesus very near the end of his life. It's a very, very exciting story. His name was Mark Barber. Shout out to all his family. Anyway, one day, the guys went to see him at the hospice, and they came back to our little storefront there and said, 
So a bit interesting, but Mark's realized like, hey, I have no appetite. This is part of what's happening with the cancer. But he, his old life, he knows how to get an appetite, which is basically, you know, how do you want, you want the munchies? You want to get the munchies? Well, then you just smoke some pot. This is before things got legalized in Canada, okay? And so they said to me, he asked us to buy him some marijuana. But we didn't think you would want us to do that. We didn't know what to do. So we want to take care and love our brother. But it just seemed like you need to handle this one. So I was like, oh, okay, fine. Leave it with me. So I went back to see Mark later that day, I think. And I said, so the guys told me that you asked them to buy some pot. And he was mortified. They told you that, you know. And and I said, yeah, so let's just talk about this for a minute. So you wanted, to buy, you wanted them to buy you pot. Like I said, obviously, we give you your pills all the time. You take cannabis in pill form for pain. So, like, I, I'm not going to say, like, oh, it's really bad to smoke it versus swallow it or whatever. Like, you're a really ill person, okay? But I want to know why, what it is that you need. And he said, well, I would love to have an appetite. Like, I don't have any appetite, and I'm going to die faster if I don't eat. I can't eat if I'm not hungry. So I just said to him, have you asked Jesus? And he was like, huh? (laughs) So the idea that body theology is engaged with the body Mm -hmm. and our journey with God would be welcoming his presence for our physical self. So I said to him, I'll tell you what, we're going to pray. We're going to invite the Holy Spirit to give you the munchies. Of course, we were always praying for healing from the cancer too, but I just thought Jesus will be real practical about this. And so I just said to him, I think lots of times we reach for something physically instead of welcoming the life of God for our physical bodies. We try to answer our our prayer ourselves, in a sense. So I said, let's just pray and ask the Lord to give you the munchies. And if you don't get the munchies in three days, I'll go buy you the pot. That was our little experiment. And sure enough, you know what happened, right? He got hungry. We prayed, and the next time I saw him, he was like, eating, eating, eating. Did he still die? Yes. But he died a happy man with the munchies. Because there was this thing of him having invited the Holy Spirit. And I just think, we got to do that more. Our worship's physical. It's not just mental and emotional. We sing, we clap, we dance, we shout, we serve, we speak, we embrace, we share. And we have to keep asking the Holy Spirit for physiological encounter, if that makes sense. Anyway, you want to wrap it up? Yeah, a lot of I just think we have to remember that we are people who are in, we are embodied. And I think part of it is that we actually have to be mindful of that. Yeah. Mindful that when you get up on Monday or Tuesday morning and your body feels creaky because you didn't get enough sleep the night before, that you got to somehow listen to that. You got to listen. We have to listen to our bodies. That is a spiritual practice. Yeah. And I think inviting the Holy Spirit and inviting the presence of God to drive our bodies yeah. day by and, day, minute by minute is a good practice. And I would say that the next time you go to the communion table, mm-hmm. wherever that is in your worship practice, It's a physical, tangible way we embody the very things we've been talking about today. The one body, many parts, all the people around you that are also coming to the same table of Jesus, the cup and the bread, remembering Christ's body being broken for us, remembering his scars on his resurrected body, singing songs, being filled with thanksgiving, and then take the life of Jesus into your physical body. It's a physical act of worship. And just keep inviting that inbreaking life of the Holy Spirit in and through our physical bodies. Send us mail. Okay, ciao. Thanks for listening to another episode of Down to Earth. We hope you've enjoyed listening and feel inspired to grow in your relationship with God and to engage your life in ways that shape your culture and community. If you enjoyed today's episode, please take a moment and leave a review on iTunes. Not only does it let us know how we're doing, but it helps other people find the show. Remember, if you have any comments, questions, or feedback, please leave them in the comments on this episode at downtoearthpodcast.com.